We're going to continue in our series, Jesus Is. And uh, last week we talked about how Jesus is our friend. Jesus is my friend was actually the, the title of last week's message. And we talked about Zacchaeus. We talked about how Zacchaeus, a man so alienated for any, anything true, he was a cheat, he was a scoundrel, he did everything in his power to steal from people in his time. As we talked about last week, Zacchaeus was recruited by Rome to be a tax collector. And he was probably an entrepreneur, he probably had great business skills, and whatever he did not have to send to Rome, he was able to keep to himself. And so he had become a professional embezzler, if you would want to call it that. Or he'd go to door to door and he'd ask people for money. He would hike the rates and prices so that he could skim off the top before sending it over to Rome. And of all people, for God, God's son to come in contact with, of all people for God's son to interact with, Jesus decided that he was going to be with Zacchaeus. We heard last week that Zacchaeus was a major reject. He was infamous and legendary. He was notorious. And one moment, one moment with Jesus Christ changed everything about this man's life. And like we talked about, we're all trying to climb our trees as Zacchaeus did. He was a wee little man, as the song says. And he was trying to get up in this tree so he could get Jesus' attention And a lot of us are doing all these things to try to get Jesus' attention. But Jesus turned around and called him by name, which makes the statement clear that Jesus already knew him. Already knew who he was. And this whole topic of Jesus is, as we lead up to Easter, this is one of the most important conclusions you will ever come to. It will change everything about your life. We have got to come to a place of real understanding about who Jesus Christ is because how we reflect on that truth will change our life. It will, it will give us great doses of mercy and love and compassion, or we would find ourselves in places of fear and regret and intimidation that Jesus never intended for us. And so this morning, this morning we're going to talk about grace. We're going to talk about that Jesus is grace. And we're going to talk a lot about God this morning, but it's important to recognize that Jesus became the very image of God reaching out to this world. That Jesus became the very image of God reaching out to change life, to rescue us from our dark and evil places. Now, like I was talking to you guys just a few minutes ago, we were going to talk about hugs this morning. And I love this illustration. Judas Smith makes this illustration in his book. But anybody who knows anything about me know that I'm the kind of person who likes to hug. Okay, but not everybody is into hugging, okay? Not everybody's comfortable with it. Not everybody likes it. Now, there are a few scenarios that I've found myself in from time to time. One of those scenarios is is when you go to hug someone and you're going to wrap your arms around them and they get nervous and they kind of shoot to the side and give you their hip. I don't know if you've ever had one of those before, but, you know, there's that side hug. And then then there's the other hug that... um, That, you know, like, they just, they don't know how to hug, and they're nervous, and they're concerned, and I don't know if you've ever hugged somebody that just became like a stiff, bored mannequin, they're just like, oh, this is uncomfortable, I don't know if I can do this. I I don't know if you guys have ever experienced that before. I think one of the funniest experiences, and it's too bad that, well, it's not too bad because he's working with the children, but it's, you know, Nathan's not up here with us this morning, but it, it it was a couple of weeks ago, and I reached in to give Nathan a hug, and we had that awkward moment. I don't know if you guys have ever experienced this before. It's not so bad when it's your spouse, but um, have you ever experienced that moment where you don't know which side of the face to go to when you're hugging? Um, needless to say, Nathan and I almost kissed. It was very, very <laughs> awkward. Um, anyway, <laughs> sorry. It's all good. We're family, right? <laughs> So anyway, um, you know, we, we find ourselves in these places where, where we're awkward, we're uncomfortable about hugging. And the truth is, is if we were to relate that to grace for just a moment, think about this, okay? Some of us, just as much as we struggle with embracing grace, 
We need to or, or struggle with an embrace. We, need, we struggle with hugging grace back. We struggle with accepting God's mercy. We struggle with accepting God's grace. We're frightened by it. God offers us something extraordinarily, extraordinary. Um, you, you know, you've heard the saying before when people say, if something's too good to be true, then it's probably not true. This is not one of those things. This is something that is definitely too good to be true, but it is true. And when we receive that moment where grace is unearned, it's unmerited, it's total forgiveness, it makes us stand there stiff and uncomfortable, waiting for the embrace to stop so that we can get back to business as usual in an attempt to earn our way to heaven. We need to learn how to embrace grace. We need to learn how to hug grace back. But the truth is, is for some of us, I mean, we understand conceptually perhaps what grace is. We have an idea or an inkling. We've heard about it before, but we don't have a full comprehension. I mean, if you're like me, you want a story. You want something clear. You want something relevant. You want something that makes sense. And the truth is, is that grace is a foundational element in our faith. Webster has eight definitions, and and, and all of these, I think, really fall short. But according to Webster, it says, uh, a charming or attractive trait or characteristic, like carrying yourself with grace, approval or favor, remaining in good graces with someone, or a title of address, like your grace, okay? Or a short prayer at meal, say grace over dinner. And perhaps one of the closest related, um, one of the closest related definitions of grace is the last definition, where it says unmerited divine assistance given humans for their regeneration and sanctification. And some of you are thinking, huh? <laughs> if you're anything like me. When you read definitions like that, you find yourself at a moment of struggle. You're wondering, okay, what in the world is divine assistance given humans for regeneration and sanctification? I mean, those are some big words. Some big words that we've heard in church, we've heard preached about. But if you're anything like me, you want to hear grace told in a story. You want to see it. You want an image. You want something to reflect on. You want something that, is, that, that you just can think about and grab a hold of. Something that's powerful, significant, and true. Something that goes directly to the heart of the matter. And one of the things that I loved about Jesus Christ, and we're going to talk about a parable in just a minute here, but one of the things that I really loved about Jesus Christ is you read through his story and you read through his experience, you discover quickly that Jesus was all about making the truth very simple and logical to understand. He was able to give stories about what was going on culturally relevant, you know, like like stories about things that happened in that culture in that day that would make sense to people when they were around and they were listening. He didn't look to, you know, impress people by his theological understanding of the truth. Jesus made his stories simple and plain. And the story that we're going to talk about this morning is the story of the prodigal son. In Luke 15, 1 and 2, just kind of preparing for this, it says, Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. And this made the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. In the New King James Version, it says, This man receives sinners and eats with them. They were frustrated. And so Jesus begins to tell three very, very specific stories. Jesus begins to share three stories out of a reflection of who his father is as a statement about what grace is. And the first one was the story of the lost sheep. Now, if you look at the story of the lost sheep, Jesus describes a shepherd who leaves the rest of the flock in the safety of the fold and goes into the wilderness to find a lost sheep. And then in John 15, 7, he kind of buttons it up with this thought. In the same way, there's more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God 
than over 99 others who are righteous and, have stray, and, and haven't strayed away. And then in the second story, he talks about this lost coin. And Jesus described a desperate search for something lost and a profuse joy when that lost thing was found. In Luke 15, 10, it says, In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. Jesus was making a statement. Jesus was trying to tell these people that when really, really bad people find mercy, when really, really bad people find grace, God is throwing a party. He is happy. He is excited. He is thrilled about this moment when lost people are found. And we should find that same exhilaration. We should find that same joy, that same excitement, that same thrill. That one person who comes to Christ should cause us to be so full of energy and life and excitement. Jesus wanted to make something very, very clear. Three stories, three lost things, three parties. Jesus wanted these self-righteous people to understand something. God loves bad people and rejoices when they turn to him. And so in Luke chapter 15, starting with verse 11, this is the parable of the lost son. It goes like this. Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons, and the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need, in verse 15. So so he went and hired, or he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And we came to his senses. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. And his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against you. In heaven, and you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and it is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called out, or he called one of the servants and asked him, What is what 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 was going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because um, because he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry and he refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you. I never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when when the son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him? My son, the father said. You are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because your brother, uh, this brother of yours, was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. The Pharisees couldn't really comprehend this. They were struggling with this thought. And that's why Jesus spoke in this kind of story. He was revealing to the Pharisees that their thoughts and their ideas, their concepts about who God was and who God is were completely out of alignment. 
You see, chastise them, yes. Make them pay back for their evil without a doubt. But throw a party? They couldn't wrap their religious rule-oriented, rule-focused minds around that level of grace. Like I was talking about earlier, these religious leaders just could not hug grace back. You see, the son wasted his money with extravagant, unrestrained living, but the father restored his son with extravagant, unrestrained grace. That is significant truth for us this morning. <laughs> Looking back at the two other stories before the prodigal son is even mentioned, what did the sheep do to be found? Did the sheep wander back towards the shepherd? Absolutely not. He didn't do a thing. If anything, he probably ran farther away. The truth is, sheep are dumb like that. And what about the coin? He's just hanging out with some dust bunnies right in a room somewhere. What did the coin do to return to the person who was searching frantically throughout her house to find it? Absolutely nothing. You see, we get stuck in this mindset that we have got to do something in order to attain God's grace and mercy. We come to these points where we feel like we have got to come a certain amount of the way in order for God to rescue us. But according to a story that Jesus shared, according to three stories, those people didn't do anything for that grace to be received. He had blown Not only his reputation and his inheritance, but also his right to be a son. He had scorned his father publicly when he slogged himself in the pig's sty in mud. And he dragged the family name behind him. You know, yeah, in the story of the prodigal son, yeah, he was repentant. Yeah, he was on his way to returning home. He was going to settle for something less glorious than what was, you know, what he thought he could have. Some of us, just a side note, some of us, we, we try to go back to God thinking just like the son thought, if I can just be a servant, maybe I'll earn a tad bit of his grace and a little bit of his favor. And we go to our father in heaven in an attempt to serve him back into the place of freedom and at least say to ourselves, well, I screwed up big this time, but at least I'll be a servant of my master. And God's all the while saying, no, you're my son. You're my daughter. You're my child. Yeah, his reputation or his repentance was important, but his self-condemnation and his self-depreciation could never make him worthy of being accepted. Never. I think of the dear dad. He started thinking in his mind. He started processing. You know, I'm in the mess of this pig slop. My father's servants get treated better than this. I'm going to go home. And he's thinking and he's pondering. He's trying to expect. He's thinking to himself, okay, how can I approach my father and make this statement? How How can I share with my dad? Dear dad, you're the greatest. No, that doesn't work. You know, dear, dear dad, if I lined up all the fathers in the world and had to pick one, I would never mind. I miss catching up with you, dad. And he, and he, and he concludes with this thought, and, and we hear him trying to tell his father this. I've sinned against heaven and against you, against everyone, and I'm no longer worthy to be your son. Just make me one of your servants. He folds up his speech. Or he, he, he ponders it a little longer and he begins the route home. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever been in a scenario or situation like this where you've wandered from the father or found yourself very far from the father and you're walking towards him or at least you're making an attempt to. You're doing everything that you can to find grace and mercy with him and you're just continuing to tear yourself down more and more And more and more. You remind yourself over and over and over again. I'm a rotten person. I've messed up. I've failed you again. I've made too many mistakes to earn your mercy and grace and your forgiveness. But you see, it's never been about how good or bad we are. It's never been conditional. I think of my children. I think about how if one of my children had wandered from home... 
I think about if one of my children had asked for their piece of what we had for them and just left and blew their inheritance and rejected everything and and squandered their life and squandered their savings and squandered their money on things that were unimportant. And if that child came wandering back home, could I stand there and say, nope, you're not fit to be my child. You can serve me and you can earn again. You're going to have to work for this. You're going to have to work back into my house. You're going to have to work back into my graces. You're going to have to work back into me forgiving you. You did some serious damage here. And we find ourselves in different places, in different relationships, where someone who's made a big mistake, a great mistake, a tragic decision, and they come wandering back, and they're doing their best to serve Or you're doing your best to serve them in an attempt to earn their mercy and earn your grace. But God never operated like that. God never worked like that. No baby is born as a result of his or her own effort. The doctor doesn't shout down the birth canal with a megaphone, come, come out, child, work your way out. You know, that's why Jesus says in his ministry that in order for us to be of him, we must be born again. And you can't, for any measure, any strength, any ability, birth yourself. It's not possible. You can't. You can't. Someone else has to do it for you. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, not that, and, not, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Our sonship, being a daughter of the king, is not based on our performance, but on Jesus' finished performance and our faith in that finished work. It's not based on how we act. Yeah, we should respond to faith. Like I've talked to you guys before about, we get so wrapped up in how we perform and how we act and how we behave. I'm telling you, when you look at grace in the face, when you find his mercy, when it's fully in your life, you won't want to turn back to sinful ways. He'll be so full of thrill and privilege and excitement that your father has accepted you home. And some of us, knew that we were saved by grace a long time ago, but somehow, somewhere, we got off track. We started thinking, for whatever reason, I've got to earn this. I've got to work hard for this. I've got to strive for this. I've got to strain for this. I've got to stress for this. I've got to do my best to stay the straight and narrow. And yes, salvation is a work like that, but we have got to realize what grace is. And this is one of the most beautiful pictures in Scripture. I love this parable because in this story, grace runs. I want you to think about the Father for a minute. Standing on the porch, week after week after week, I imagine for however long His Son was gone, He would walk out onto the porch and peer into the horizon of His land and just hope that perhaps He would see the silhouette of His Son returning home. Imagine that this Father looked out day after day after day, just waiting for Him to return. His neighbors and His friends and His family members saying, Give up. It's over. He's gone to squander his life on wild living. You are a fool to stand here on this porch and wait. But he persistently scanned the horizon. The father never gave up. To him, this had nothing to do with what was deserved, what was fair, or what was expected. This was personal. This was his son, this was his child. And I love the terminology that Jesus uses when he's reading this or when he's stating this, uh, this parable. He says, while the sun was a far way off or a long way off. I mean, when, when, you know, it, it could be like he was a little ways away. No, he makes it a point to say he was a long way off. I imagine that the father looked and, and perhaps he saw a silhouette that looked familiar and he lost all constraint. He lost all you know, normal thought and he just began to chase. He just began to run towards his child. 
No amount of effort on our part is going to earn us grace. It's God's gift to us. I just imagine this son in this story and he's standing back there and he's walking and he's thinking, I'm such a rotten sinner. I have blew my dad's inheritance. I've ruined the family name. I've made so many dumb choices. I was in right standing. I live with him. I was in a good place and I decided to squander my wealth and squander my side of the inheritance. He's never going to love me again. I'm going to have to just be a servant. And he looks off into the distance and he looks to see what looks like a wild man running after him with every ounce of energy that he has. And Jesus is trying to communicate a crazy love, a super extravagant, lavish love, a love that overcame this father. I want you to understand something about culture in that time. The Middle East men, it was considered taboo for men to run. Like it just wasn't, it wasn't normal. It wasn't a part of their culture. It, it was considered a, a, a thing that, that men don't do, that fathers don't do. Like this was like, I imagine that the religious leaders are all standing there and the people are all standing there listening to this story. And Jesus said, and the, when the father saw him a long way off, he ran. They're like, <gasps> What? No, no, no pence. He's not going to have to sacrifice all these different things. He's not going to have to earn his favor back or his graces back. The father started chasing after him. And even in the darkest moments of sin and self-centeredness, God still loves us. The moment he sees an inkling of repentance, I really believe this. Like when he sees us off in the distance, I believe God starts getting excited he starts anticipating it's coming. It's going to happen. We're in a moment. It's, it's just so close. And he begins to pursue us even stronger. He begins to love us even more. He begins to smother us with his embrace. The struggle is, is we don't know how to hug grace back. And the son, the son just, I mean, he's, he's smothered here. He's smothered. I mean, his father probably literally almost tackles him to the ground. His father ran to him. His father ran to him. And he smothers him with this embrace. He smothers him with this love. And he calls for a robe. He calls for a ring. He calls for sandals. He says, let's throw a party. And every soul, every soul, That he finds. We know that the Bible says that the angels in heaven rejoice over one soul. I bet it's ridiculous. I bet they go crazy. But that's grace. The prodigal son deserved punishment. He deserved to be disowned. He deserved to be banished. In the, new, in the King James Version, Luke 15, 20, it says that, 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 that um, filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. Another translation says that he fell on his neck. And I just wonder, perhaps at that point, because, I mean, the father saw him a long way off. He's probably up in age, running, gasping for air. I'm going to hug my son. He's returning home. He's coming home. And perhaps the son is trying to squirm free. He's trying to get out of his father's hands because he's created this plea. Remember, he's created this speech. I'm going to tell my father that I'm not fit to be his son, but I'll be a servant. And he starts to, and he starts to tell, Dad, I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy. And mid-speech, his dad stops him, ignores his logic. It's flawed anyway, his son's logic. And he calls for the servants to bring new clothes and a new ring and new sandals. His boy is home. His boy has returned. His son doesn't feel that he deserves honor. His son doesn't feel that he deserves respect. In fact, his brother feels the same way. And I mean, I can't imagine. I know that we've gotten to these places before where we see God's unrestrained grace and mercy and we say to ourselves, I'm not deserving. And we argue with him. 
We do. He's trying to smother us with hugs and kisses. He's trying to wrap his arms around us and love us and tell us how much he cares and how glad he is that we are home. And what do we do? We fight it. We, we push back. We say, no, I've got to fight for this. I've got to earn this. I've got to be at least your servant. I've got to be at least your servant. Remember at the beginning here, I was telling you that some of us struggle with the big, lofty definitions of grace. Sometimes it doesn't make sense to us when we see those big words. So I told you a story this morning. This is grace. Bewildered but suddenly hopeful, the son enters his father's house and a party starts. People are overjoyed to see him. They welcome him home. There is no shame. There is no guilt. And there is no rejection. That's grace. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. I asked uh, Kelly to sing a song this morning. I don't know if, uh, if you guys are familiar with this. It's an old tune that I, used to, I, I still love. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of uh, the song When God Ran. It's a beautiful song. And I just, I want her to play that for you this morning. And as she's singing that, I want to ask you these two last questions as, as she's singing these words. How will you let go of your own attempts and efforts to attain his love? Number one, how will you let go of that? And number two, how will you choose to completely embrace grace today (laughs) Father God we just pray right now I pray right now for the weary soul that is contemplating and dealing and battling with the fear that They're not even fit to be a servant of you, God. I pray, Father, for those this morning who have wandered far, that have made decisions that they're not proud of, that have made mistakes that have caused them to feel that they're not even fit to be called your child. I pray, Lord, right now that we would recognize that Jesus Christ is the perfect example of grace, that he came to this world. He was your chase. He was your running at us, making us able to find hope and peace with you again. Oh, Jesus, you're so amazing. I thank you for this new reality, and I pray, God, that we would stop trying so hard and realize that you're after us. That you're after us. Thank you, Jesus. If there's anybody in this room that has yet to experience the freedom that Christ offers, don't you dare leave this sanctuary until I've talked to you, okay? Because there's freedom that should be had today. Amen? Amen. 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 I love you guys.